So the topic, the headline for our conversation is the impact of inflation across the tech sector. And we've kind of had a reminder of that today. We have the Federal Reserve coming out with their latest rate decision later today. They're expected to raise interest rates once again by about a quarter of a point, a quarter of about 25 basis points. The Bank of England as well, they're up tomorrow. And we had a reminder of the inflation impact here in the UK, double digits again and well above the estimates. And then you had the European Central Bank Governor, Madame Lagarde, talking today about the need to get inflation back down to 2%. Inflation, of course, tying into this higher rates environment. And that, of course, has impacted funding across the tech sector. So just how bad has it been as you've all wrestled and your portfolio companies and your LPs have all wrestled with this record high, historically high inflation? Maybe I'll start with you, Carolina. Of course. And thank you for having me. Um, I, I would break that down into two different um, challenges. Um, I think, of course, the first one is, um, which is probably the, the longer term one, which is the operating environment, is much more hostile than it had been for a lot of time, for a lot of time, especially for, for tech and growth businesses. Capital had been um, cheap and abundant, um, and so you could take risks, and you could, um, you could fail, and you could try again, and you could expand, and you could take share, um, and you could throw money at you know, inefficiencies. Um, and now, you know, the environment obviously requires a different kind of muscle and a different kind of strategy, whether that's increasing prices, whether that's, you know, being leaner, um, whether that's guiding more towards profitability, all of the above, et cetera. So I think that's been on the operating front. It's just a different environment to, to operate in. Um, and the second one is, of course, the impact that interest rates have on valuations, um, which is a bit of a simple corporate finance economics problem that when interest rates rise, um, forward multiples decline. Um, and that, of course, has had a big impact on um, companies' um, appetite to come to market. <laughs> um, and if they do come to market, of course, the, the valuation shift that has happened from 2020, 2021 um, into 22 and, and today. Eric, does that, does that echo with what you've seen? Your Series A, you're an early C-plus investor. Does it mirror what you're seeing across your portfolio? You know, it actually does. And I was glad um, when Carolina made those statements. And again, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. When I think about some of the other dynamics that are, that are occurring within our portfolio that we see a bit more widely, is that because of something like, and it was mentioned in, the last, in that last little quick bit, that because Silicon Valley Bank is gone, mm. and, or it's gone in the form that, it, that we're used to seeing it, it also creates a dynamic where we're finding that institutions that we were able to rely on who did things differently than high street banks, that were able to look at risk a little bit differently, who are able to partner with us around venture debt and other sorts of things, if they're being removed from the market, we're finding that this environment, which is a challenging environment for most of our entrepreneurs who are young entrepreneurs who've never been through a cycle and sort of seen a down cycle, they've only seen a cycle where there's been lots of money and it's been very cheap those individuals and those organizations don't have the, one of the biggest institutions that was actually established to help them mm. to actually get through these sorts of times. So this is sort of a one, two, three whammy for them. I am optimistic, though, because what I do believe comes from this is we get some working out of some business models that aren't that interesting. They were able to be funded because of cheap capital and that those sorts of things that maybe so many, too many social media networks, too many whatever it is, that, the, that those things actually that didn't have great business models, we'll see if there'll be some pullback in terms of the allocation of capital to them. And maybe we'll be looking at more established and interesting um, portfolio kinds of company and business models, which then says what we see in the UK and Europe becomes a bit more interesting since there is less of that sort of hype culture that's associated with businesses and the kinds of business models are looking a bit more at revenue generation. They're looking a bit more at sophisticated business models that are able to scale with the infusion of capital. So in some ways, I'm pretty optimistic mm. at this point that inflation is helping to clear the decks. Okay, well, that's really, really fascinating. And we're going to get to Silicon Valley mm -hmm. Bank, of course. We'll get more of your views on that in just in the next few minutes. But I want to stay with the current topic. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting you said maybe clearing out some of the dead wood. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a little bit more resilience here in, the, in, in, in Europe in terms of the tech, uh, the tech sector. And maybe some of that resilience is already ingrained in those business models. Tarvet, given that you were a founder, of course, of Wise, now you're running and a partner, a co-founder in Plural, uh, your own VC platform. What, what's your take on what's happening? Is there a necessary clear out that's happening? How resilient is, is the tech space at this point? I mean, I think in, the, in broad terms, we have gone from an environment of abundance to an environment of scarcity. And it starts at the kind of the top of the funnel, which is with LPs and, and venture funds. You know, so I'm confident that we will see a bunch of venture funds that will be unable to raise their next, uh, next funds. 
and we'll see less capital being available to the, to the venture firms, which means there's going to be less capital available for companies. So I think it's going to trickle through all, all the way through the chain. But I do think that uh, in the light of this, uh, I'm very optimistic. I don't think creativity and entrepreneurship has gone anywhere. And you know, as a matter of fact, uh, we can probably, we, we will look back and most likely say that uh, in 2020 and 2019, companies were getting funded too easily. Hmm. You know, if you kind of think about it, maybe, maybe especially as a result of COVID when there was a lot of basically shotgun weddings, you met an entrepreneur over a Zoom call for 45 minutes, and then after that there was an auction. And they, were, they had four offers to raise money from, and you know, nobody had met these people. There was like no time to do due diligence, which is very weird. And I think we're seeing the results of that now. So <clears throat> we're probably going to be back at a world which is more normal. We have time to meet the founders, get to know them. We have time to do due diligence. And you know, we've probably seen some of the big failures of due diligence, due diligence also. So I think you know, we'll be able to back a lot more companies uh, that, are do, that are much more serious about what they're doing. And I think specifically, if you think about, you know, I would maybe highlight two areas where there is a giant pull right now. One is climate. If you think about the overall energy transition theme and the amount of new technology that has to be deployed to make this happen, it's going to be a huge pull. And similarly, I think the other pull is going to be everything around AI. You know, yes, we can, we can chat with ChatGPT and make fun of it, but if you think about the productivity improvements this will have across so many sectors, it's going to be a massive pull. Okay, and we want to come back to that point as well. William, let's bring you in at this point. Do you share this relative optimism that we're hearing? Well, I'm certainly relatively optimistic. I think we're very much at the opposite end of the market, though. So the companies that we're investing mm. in are very, very big public companies, and they're huge. And uh, that problem for years hasn't been getting hold of cash. It's what on earth you do with all this cash they generate. So they're very free cash flow positive. They're very profitable. Um, uh, and uh, they generally have substantial pricing power. So an inflationary environment isn't sort of life-threatening. because They just need to do that the best in that environment. Um, and I think where some of the very big companies are laying off headcount, that actually is, is creating the seeds of the next round of disruption because those people aren't being, if you know, Meta lays off people here, they're not going to be hired by Alphabet because Alphabet laid off the week before. Those people are now in their garages and kitchens working out what the next round of disruption is going to be. So it's a long time before that makes its way to, to me, but it goes through you three first as well. You digest it, take your cut, and then, then I buy it when it's big. Um, so each, each period of difficulty creates the seeds of the next upside. And it's, it's healthy, really. And the, getting rid of the dead wood is an excellent, excellent. Silicon Valley Bank, then, and we'll go there, because we've had sil what, Silvergate signature, sil Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic is teetering on the edge. Credit Suisse, of course, taken over by UBS, which was momentous mm -hmm. in, it, in its own right. So I'll start with a tough question. Who here had exposure to SVB? Mm -hmm. Okay. In our portfolio, you did. In your portfolio, you did. Yes. And, and how have you, managed, have you managed, managed those risks? As HSBC took over the UK part of the business, does that mean you were relative, left relatively unscathed? And how, how, uh, to what extent have you been diversifying your, your deposits and, and your bank accounts? Uh, I think at the end of the day, so we, as a fund, we were not, uh, well, actually, we did bank uh, with SVB as a fund, but uh, that exposure was limited. But mm. in the portfolio, there was uh, lots of exposure. But what we're doing about it now, I mean, I think it just goes back to the basics of what maybe we should have been all thinking about a bit more. Don't rely on a single vendor. Like when running a business, you never want to be only on, on one vendor. So same applies to your banking. You need to have multiple bank accounts. You need to think a little bit about how much you keep or what liquidity you need. You know, yeah, I don't think you can get rid of this risk. But you know, whether you go into the systemically important banks or just diversify across a few, I think that's kind of it's pretty sane advice, which. Uh, I think as individuals, we have thought about it different times in life, and as companies, we just need to just be a little bit more diligent about. Because again, it ties to the inflation question. The, the, the reason the deposits fled was because higher rates, they hadn't marked to market, the securities had downgraded in terms of their values. So it's all tied again to the big and overarching question on, on inflation. Carolina, how, how have you navigated this? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, to, to that point, it, it was a perfect storm because in 2020 and 21, where companies were doing big rounds, they had all this cash sitting on the balance sheet. And for European companies sitting on the balance sheet in the European banks, you were actually losing money, right? Because the interest rates were, were where they were, which caused many people to flock to banks like SVB that actually had nice interest rates. Hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, in many boards, we looked at treasury management. And the exercise was, of course, 
you know, where can we, you know, of course, diversify the capital, but also put capital places where it's also not losing value, value at the minimum. Um, and so I think the, the, the triple whammy was a good example because it, of course, the cycle turned. And for those that didn't turn their attentions to this very quickly, they, of course, got caught out. Um, and of course, the younger companies are the companies that have the less mature finance teams um, that don't have necessarily someone looking at treasury management and risk management, which a lot of the larger companies would, um, and uh, which was, of course, a sort of unfortunate confluence of, of circumstances. And Eric, I know you have views on this, the access mm -hmm. to capital, the access to funding. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing already evidence that loan requirements are becoming more restrictive, that there's less risk among the banking sector as they adjust to the, to the crisis that is rippling across that, across that sector. Uh, it is an impossible question, but to what extent and when do you think the tide is going to turn on the access to capital, the deep freeze that we're seeing? It's a great question, Tom. And I'm so concerned about this question for two reasons. One is that I actually believe that maybe people who were in Silicon Valley Bank and either they had um, venture debt there, uh, a line of credit, or they actually had their deposits have all been, they're all safe at the moment. Mm. The point that we're always thinking about as venture capitalists is we're looking for the next thing. And so there's, an there's another company that's being started today in a garage in a kitchen, mm. not having access to Silicon Valley Bank. The repercussions of this will continue on and on. The challenge of even starting a bank, what I find when we're trying to do an investment with a, with a small company, is that those companies can't even get a bank account. It takes them so long to find one, so they go to you know, one of the challenger banks very, very quickly and so, because they can set up an account. And Silicon Valley Bank was one of the banks that they would go to. Without that sort of ability, we're in a different sort of a situation, a different world. Whereas if you're an incumbent and you're pretty well financed and you had venture capital funding and you had it in a bank, those are all statuses that most many organizations don't have. So being in Silicon Valley Bank and having those protected by some government or some other organization bought you, that's one thing. Many of these organizations don't have access. And particularly when we look at women and people of color, um, although Silicon Valley Bank was much better than the average high street bank, it's not as if most all of our investments are women and people of color. And the only exposure we had were to, to Silicon Valley Bank were banks that had already exited. The ones that we have in our current portfolio, none of them bank with Silicon Valley Bank, which is an interesting statement. I don't know what that says. And I don't know what that says about when things will turn around. And I don't predict that because I haven't answered your question at all. I like my question, so I answered answer that one. But um, instead, you know, it is one of these challenges that I believe it has repercussions mm -hmm. for years to come. And we will be contending with this for a long time. This is not temporary, in my opinion. Okay, repercussions for years to come. William, let me put you on the spot on this question then, because you brought up the jobs picture and you put mm -hmm. it in a positive light, but we're talking about 30,000 jobs just at Amazon alone, 21,000 from Meta, 150,000 tech jobs since October alone. There's people hurting out there. When do you think the bloodletting, the cutting of jobs, when does that stop? When do we get to a point where the tech sector can take a breather and say, we've done enough on the jobs front? Well, I still think it's quite positive, to be honest, because the biggest scarcity in the whole attack was basically good software engineers. And there is now a pool of software engineers that's floating around looking for the next job. So they might set up their own thing in the kitchen, but if not, you can hire them a slightly less ludicrous options program than you did before. So again, I actually think it's quite, quite healthy. So, you know, the yeah. inflation occurs because you have shortages of supply, and one of the biggest shortages of supply is for engineers. Um, it's not a shortage anymore. Carolina, your, your portfolio companies, where, where do you think they are? Are you leaning on them still to cut headcount? Are they, have they slimmed down enough? Do you expect more job cuts at a significant level? And we've got a chart, Bloomberg chart, and the, the data there showing the uptick, the red line being the tech sector versus media, healthcare, food, mm -hmm. financial services. And there's the, the steep jump that we've seen. What is the, your assessment? The answer is it, it depends. Um, firstly, it really depended on the kind of business. So I think the businesses that were exposed to the consumer were much faster to cut because they could very clearly see um, that you know we might enter a recession and therefore discretionary spend might, might go down and we can't really predict the future. So let's control what we can't control. Um, I think what we've seen now, probably in the second half of last year, is it's starting to hit enterprise businesses and software businesses. Um, lots of companies now looking at their procurement function and cutting you know, all the software that they've bought for many years. And I think you're starting to see software companies you know, uh, bring their guidance down. And so that is probably sort of the, the next layer, I, w I would say. Um, and then it really depended on the entrepreneur. 
Um, I sort of take it back. Some of the entrepreneurs that I think have been through cycles um, that ran leaner anyway were very fast to control what we, they could control, um, whereas you know others have wanted to keep spending in technology, in building value in the business, um, until of course they saw something happen. So it's a, you know, it's a generic answer, but you know I think thus is the beauty of a portfolio is <laughs> there's mm. diversity in it. Talbot, do you? Do the companies, the European tech companies, come out of this leaner, more match fit to take on their competitors, whether it's within this region or versus the US or Asia, China? Or are they going to get to the point where they rue the day, where they're cutting the headcount? Are they, are they, is there a risk of going too far, given that, that battle over talent that we talked about? So I spend most of my time investing in early stage companies, and I think you have to be optimistic. You have to be an optimist when you do that as a, as a living. And I look at all of this as opportunity. You know, even what we spoke about SVB mm. has an opportunity for other people to step in. Go to WISE, the company I started. Any startup can open an account, sir. We don't discriminate based on color or, or sex, though. Mm -hmm. I think there is this op huge opportunity for everyone else mm -hmm. uh, to mop up all the opportunity left. If I think about the European startups, I think the opportunity is great. They've always been more leaner than their US counterparts. Eh? And maybe it's, part, it's because lack of capital, lack, lack of access to to, to capital, like they've been less capitalized than US peers, and that makes them much stronger businesses. So of course, we'll, we've seen layoffs, and I, I would assume we're gonna see more layoffs, but I actually think European companies are gonna be much better positioned to, to survive in a world with less capital, because they've kind of, they've been brought up in the mindset of don't overspend, look for smart opportunities. What should companies be doing in terms of prioritizing, reducing, uh, their cost cutting. And I'll, I'll get back to you, Tarvit, on this, but maybe, Carolina, you're nodding, so I'll start with you, and we can bring it round, round, round the rest of the panel. When you come through and you draw up a list and you, you, you talk to your founders and you say, look, this is what you should be prioritizing. Is it creating efficiencies, automation, digitization, head cut counts? What should be the priority at this point? So for us, everything has to come out of the strategy, right? Which really we rely heavily on the entrepreneurs, the management team to tell us, what are your two to three must win battles, right? And let's align the organization completely, completely behind those. Um, and depending on what resources you need to invest into to get there, come the decisions to cut costs, right? I think obviously GNA is the pretty obvious one. I think a lot of companies, and in Europe as well, had become very bloated because when money is cheap and you're growing very fast, the easiest thing to do is hire more people and throw money at problems. Um, and so a lot of teams just don't have the muscle um, to, to, to think about efficiency, productivity, and come back. And so I think GNA is the universal one. Um, I think as um, glass half full people and technology enthusiasts, um, we always feel um, that the last resort is cutting too much of R&D because that is really your long-term competitive advantage. Um, but sometimes you have to take a step back um, to, to grow stronger from that. And, and one of the things that I was thinking about, you know, about 07, 08, et cetera, is I've never really seen an entrepreneur that has cut costs where it feels like it's the bone and, and it hurts for a little bit, but then they always feel better afterwards because you can always, you know, pile it back on. William? Well, again, uh, it's, it's a less urgent situation for our companies because they're not sort of on the edge of survival. Absolutely agree, R&D is the one thing they, they mustn't cut. And the, the really well-run ones will actually be pushing up the R&D because you probably get more for your money at this point. Um, beyond that, you know, these are big companies that are very aware of costs. There's maybe not as much bloat in many of our business, the businesses we invest in as there is in sort of some of the social networks and so on. Um, so I'm not sure I'd have any great guidance okay. for management. <laughs> Eric, where do you want to be swinging the knife? Or do you want to be raising prices? Do you want to be leaning on your founders to say, look, this is the time to put up prices? Oh. Well, if we, in our portfolio, we have digital technology, health education, lifestyle, media and entertainment. That's where we focus in terms of sectors. The one that we have the biggest challenge with and where we really have to ask question is the cost of customer acquisition. So it's really marketing spend. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, and you know, it's a double-edged sword. If you cut your marketing spend such that you're not acquiring new customers, the question is, will you be able to then build um, in terms of your revenue and so your top line revenues? The problem is that we have gotten so used to spending so much money to get customers at any cost. And so we will run through 
thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in order to acquire customers, which then often will churn. So we then ask you to focus on our portfolio, to focus on how do we can continue to keep our customers, how do we increase their spend per customer, and so look at a different set of metrics around incumbent, and then think if we can transfer some of the, what would have otherwise been expenses associated with acquiring new, with maintaining and growing existing. And that's a bit of a shift for some organizations. It often means that we end up then looking at the marketing organization, looking at the people who are sitting there doing things that are uh, you know, search engine optimization, all that. Those are places we think we can actually cut some. Mm -hmm. Data science, we don't cut. Mm -hmm. Okay, not cutting, not cutting data science. Tarvet, mm -hmm. uh, you've invested uh, as part of Plural and your, and your platform in, in dozens, over 100 uh, different startups. Some of those are in the hardware space in renewable energy. You touched on the renewable energy, the transition. There's the input cost component there. How challenging has that been? Adjusting to supply chains, material costs, input costs, those businesses that you've invested in, whether it's the battery storage business I'm thinking of, to what extent has that been a challenge? I think for anyone who is dealing with physical goods, it's been, it has been challenging. You know, you have, you had the supply chain disruptions, you have the price hike. So I think that's put people in, in, a, in a difficult spot. You know, a lot of it goes back to how how well did you do with the previous fundraising? You know, if you were if you were raising the minimal amount possible, potentially if you were trying to be too greedy, too dilu uh, too sen sensitive to dilution, like you just didn't get enough money. And now it now we're at the time where it hurts. You know, I think same time if you're looking at businesses who were well capitalized to raise money for two years ahead, then get over it. You know, hopefully you can make up for all of these things by charging higher prices. Okay, let, let's lean into the opportunities then in this environment. Mm -hmm. It's all about inflation. So what about deflation? Is there an investment theme around deflation, whether it's digitization, creating, creating efficiencies, automation, artificial intelligence, which one of you brought up earlier. Um, Carolina, do you have a view on, on what the opportunities are around deflation, a deflationary play? Is that something you've been thinking about? Or? Yeah, so we think about, I, I think inherently in few invest in, in technology, you believe in digitization, automation, mm. move to the cloud, which are all things that you know, create savings and, and drive efficiencies. Um, if you look at our pipeline right now, we have a lot of companies in the software side that are mission critical software. So again, where can you acquire a customer and then have that customer be really sticky and drive you know, um, efficiency and savings to the heart of the organization? Um, we're looking at sectors that are really either not digitized or have huge opportunity, so healthcare, um, climate, um, those sort of big spaces, lots of work to do, and where even a marginal change has big impact. Um, so we think about it from a, a sector lens, I would say. And William, I know you've got views on generative AI, a lot of hype around chat GPT and other platforms, but you think there's applications around healthcare applying generative AI, and I just wonder in terms of the efficiencies there, if that is something to, to, to look at. Generative AI for healthcare. Um, did I just come up with this? At the I think you may have. I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I I maybe I said something was misinterpreted. I'm sure. Okay. Um, uh, the stuff. Artificial <laughs> intelligence in terms in of dis drug discovery. Yes. So, there, so that clearly is. Which is very is, heavy yeah, R&D spend. Absolutely. So. And, and it, it creates enormous spend on IT. So there's lots of brilliant companies that are doing exciting stuff with AI of all sorts of different types. The way that we look at it, that's not actually where you make any money because those are the companies that are spending the money, and they're spending the money with the businesses that we own that are providing with the, the semiconductors, the hardware, the software, the IT services to create that, to run that, to link that up, to, to roll that into your business. So whatever you spend money on that's even vaguely technology related, in the end, the profits come to my companies. Uh, and it's a very small group, and, and they make all the money. Uh, and you guys are yeah. all very exciting, but my ones are the ones that make the money. Eric? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> um, Try to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> that. That is interesting. That's and probably very, very true. Um, I, the only thing that I would add is that we do believe that there are some technologies. Do we actually believe at ImpactX that what we're seeing in terms of open AI and chat um, are sort of transformative. Absolutely. We do believe these things are transformative. Do we think that they create some opportunities? We've been trying to run a few tests in the real world as to how they actually work. So we've been trying to have people do things that are considered um, cost savings. Can you actually create code from this? So how is your code generation going? So we were working with a group of um, 
of um, CT CTOs about this question, asked them to sort of do something relatively simple. We found that they were able to get some savings at the very beginning of the process, but they found themselves somewhat hampered later on because they still had to go back and they still had to look through and they still had to sort of deconstruct what was actually going on. None of the things that we hoped could happen by generating pictures of bears, you know, jumping around by saying, I want to see a bear jump and creating those sort of pictures. <laughs> Does it then lead us to code that can actually then be embedded as scalable code within a solution? We were finding that harder to do. So for us, we certainly do look at AI and we think of AI as being sort of applied. Um, and sort of applied AI for consumer purposes to be an interesting space, and that there'll be some organizations that are doing the plumbing of AI that are going to do very, very well, obviously, OpenAI and others. But the question as to is it so transformative that it means that everyone else is knocked out of, out of existence, that you know, suddenly Google is irrelevant, and therefore um, search and ad spending is irrelevant, and that this will be another way of doing things. We haven't been able to get to the conclusion that that is likely to happen in the short term. Incumbents are very hard to displace. Mm. You know, and, and I'm not sure that there are a lot of competitive barriers. Once someone shows us how to do it with AI, I'm not sure that it's too difficult to then follow on with that and then say, because of our distribution network and others, like Microsoft and others, that we're able to then copy. And then we don't find that there's much value as we thought in those original companies. That's just what we're finding at the moment. And it's very expensive. It is so the computing power required is enormous. So you almost want to create a new business model to pay for it. Yeah. Okay. So I, Let I, Tava, let's bring you in. I, I would add to this that if we're looking at, you know, em employment is still high. So everyone who has people heavy businesses is actually in, in a pretty bad spot. Whether we're talking about healthcare, where we will find plenty of applications where we will be able to reduce headcount requirements by employing, uh, employing AI. And while, this, while the compute costs are high, they're much less than employing real human beings. And similarly, I think you know, we can think of a lot of services sector. You know, we can think about the legal profession. I, I, I think that if we look back three years from now, we'll see massive companies being built that are helping to sol solve these problems. And lots of people uh, out of work. And people, you know, whether it's lots of people out of work or actually just more productivity mm. thanks to making use of AI. Okay. The problem is, you know, there is still, you know, think about hospitals. Can you find nurses? It's really hard to fill these jobs. So if you find even even simple ways of uh, increasing efficiency by 10%, these are going to be huge numbers. But with, within that, I mean, not so much thinking about saving the headcount, but the delivery of drugs and the development of drugs, just the application of precision medicine completely transforms the economics of discovering deploying and actually then using um, uh, drugs and, and, and other medical treatments. And that really, I mean, it, it, it must be the answer to one of society's biggest questions, which is how do we pay for healthcare costs which are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If, if we can completely transform the economics of de developing and, and delivering treatments and then get the right treatment to the right person and not use lots of things which aren't going to work on them, you know, just because everyone's assumed to be the same. You know, if you target your, your, your drug delivery on the people who genetically it will work on, you don't waste on the others, then that has enormous benefits to society and for the patients who they get the right thing first. Yeah. And, and the companies that are doing it make a huge amount of money. So that, that's got to be a, an enormous answer. And that's you know, a, a very much based on a, a lot of technology, a lot of artificial intelligence. Um, so in the end, a lot of that money comes to us as well, but um, it helps everyone. I'm going to try and... I'm, I'm, <laughs> I love this theme, William. I love it too. I'm gonna try, it works. <laughs> uh, it's working for William. I'm going to try and pivot to a question, a viewer question on, on the UK. Um, and this, this question is, is phrased as, why is the UK, and you may dispute this, the way, it's, mm. the way it's put, this question, why is the UK losing its crown as the tech centre of Europe? The Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Prime Minister, wants to make this the UK, the next Silicon Valley. Maybe they won't use Silicon Valley in, in the branding, but they certainly want to drive the tech sector. Healthcare is a central part of that. Is the UK losing its tech crown? Carolina, Eric, Eric, you've got well, views. Well, so I'm on the board of Tech Nation. So you know, so call, so tell me that I'm, uh, that I'm colored tech. Um, when we look at sort of where are the areas that have produced, say, just use one um, metric of unicorn creation. So if you look at the world, there have been three um, places in the world that have produced over 100 unicorns. There's the US, there's China, and then there's the UK. So when you look at, and the UK is now about you know, 130, 150 unicorns, when you look at those sorts of numbers, and that, that, that dwarfs what's present in other parts of Europe in terms of the number of unicorns that have been produced and decacorns that have been produced in um, Scandinavia, in Germany, in France, et cetera. So the question of is there a, 
is it, have we lost the, the um, sheen of UK tech and that UK tech is not producing in the way that it once did? I, I, I don't see the evidence of that. We're getting ready to publish the Tech Nation report tomorrow, in fact, that's going to be talking about how, in fact, this has been another banner sort of a period for tech mm -hmm. creation in the UK. So I don't exactly understand that question. It's, I, okay. I, I, I don't know where it's coming from. What are the data points? So if I understood the data points, I might be able to answer better. OK, Br just briefly, uh, Carolina mm -hmm. Tarvet, and I just want to get to a quick poll before we end. Mm -hmm. Carolina. Yeah, and, and actually, I think Tarvet might, might be much better positioned to answer this, having lived through it. But mm -hmm. I think what I'd like to see that I do think is an increasing challenge in mm -hmm. the UK for technology companies is um, the IPO market, where okay, I think I other close. parts of Europe mm -hmm. um, are really gaining ground mm -hmm. and have a very deep pool of investors who understand tech companies may be IPOing not at the mature m profit mm -hmm. margins that they may be one day that don't necessarily have such, such abrupt sell-offs. Um, so I think that would be something that uh, personally I would like to see you know, mm -hmm. get better for technology companies. On top of it. So I, when it comes to company creation early and mid-stage companies, I'm not sure I've seen the data to say that London is losing its position. But you know, overall, I think I'd be rooting for all of Europe, but I think London is at a very good position. And as long as London keeps on attracting talent, I think this will continue. When it comes to the IPO market, I'm not sure I see any other European exchange besides London. But I'm also not sure that I see a very bright future ahead for the London Stock Exchange. Yeah, the London Stock Exchange is It's a very tricky decision where would you, why would you list here? We have yeah, a poll up, I'm just looping back to the top of our conversation, mm -hmm. which is about the Federal Reserve, or about interest rates. <laughs> yep. uh, and the question really, in this, in this kind of capital constrained environment, do we get to the point where we have to see a cut in interest rates for that funding environment to improve? The tech funding deep freeze won't end until the interest rates, until interest rates are cut. And so that is up now, you're all voting on it. So we'll see, <laughs> false, okay. Pretty, pretty, pretty strong views coming through on uh, the dependency or not for uh, central banks to cut interest rates. Uh, finally, do you, have a, do you have a view on this? Is it more complicated than that? Can we live in a high interest environment? The likes of William's former employees at BlackRock think rates are going to be held for, for a pretty long time because it's going to get hard, hard to get inflation back down to the yes. central bank target. So we're going to have to live in a higher interest rate environment for longer. Can the capital requirements, can liquidity come back to the tech sector in that environment? I certainly think so. Um, and I think there's, um, you know, I, I, I'm from Brazil originally, so I'm very familiar with um, inflation mm. and high interest rates. And I think great companies can, can come from that, can, um, can, have, can experience great success. You need to operate differently. You need to think about the capital markets differently. Um, but I do think that it, it can be quite healthy. Um, as well in the way that the capital flows and the way that people operate their businesses. Um, and, you know, the data does show that actually some of the biggest technology companies, um, and I think WISE might be an example of this, came out of times of great disruption, um, of hard times. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm actually, as an investor, very excited. Okay, before we let you go, any, any last one, uh, anyone else who wants to chime in before we wrap it up on that point? No, we're all that's happy. happy. The, uh, yeah, so that's the conclusion then. We don't need rate cuts before that funding environment can improve necessarily. Eric may have slightly different views, but I think <laughs> no, we like, like rate cuts, cuts but I mean, <laughs> you know, we're going to have to live with that. Well, uh, Elon Musk would like to see a 50 mm. basis point cut later today from the Federal Reserve. We'll see if that comes through. Uh, you've all been absolutely uh, insightful, fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for your time. We're ending there on a note of relative optimism. Uh, in this kind of challenged environment amidst this banking crisis and record high inflation, there is still optimism uh, from these leaders in the world of tech. So thank you all very much indeed. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.